Junior High was dedicated in 1970. It was named for Ted Blevins. Uh, and the school is at the 2101 South Taft Hill. Ted is still living on uh, West Prospect. Grew up in Kansas and is a, at the age of 16 was a member of the uh, Kansas National Guard and in World War I, he fought in the Argonne Forest. In 1925 to 1940, he was the director of physical education and the coach in Fort Collins. He was a basketball coach, and uh, it would uh, would not be surprising to know that uh, their first son, Teddy, was born on the night of a basketball game. So Margaret went to the hospital and had uh, Teddy, and um, uh, Ted went to the basketball game. From 1940 to 1965, he taught math at Lincoln Junior High. Uh, he was a Sunday school teacher for 15 years. He sponsored the High Y for 15 years. Uh, Ted was much in demand as a substitute teacher until uh, uh, the last uh, year or so. Till, uh, just great. Everybody loves Ted Blevins. Even, um, even some of the ones that uh, had experienced his uh, application of the walnut paddle that he had when he was in... Uh, school. He had this uh, paddle and he was apt to use it on occasion from the, on some of the students and in return afterwards the students always signed, got to sign the paddle and I think eventually it became a status symbol to have, uh, have your name on uh, Ted Blevins' paddle. Hi, this is Don Baker and we're here today with Theodore Roosevelt Blevins, who Blevins was named after on June 21, 1983. Mr. Blevins, when were you born? September 20, 1898. And where were you born? Oskaloosa, Kansas. Oskaloosa is a small town about halfway between uh, uh, Kansas City and Topeka. If you count all of them in the cemetery, you'd have about a thousand people. Um, where did you go to school? Oscar High School, Washburn College in Topeka. Uh, I went to school in France at uh, La Lambon Aine. Do you want to write that down? Maybe you can skip it if you want to. That was a French military school, which during the war they turned over in training for United States troops. I was sent down as an instructor in uh, grenade throwing. So that's part of my education. And I have my master's degree uh, from uh, Colorado State University, counseling and guidance. I understand you're an athlete. Can you tell us some about that? <laughs> well, I had to be born with a lot of muscle and, and uh, get up and go. And I uh, played football and basketball and track. <clears throat> I got a scholarship to Washington University. Uh, I graduated with the highest grades in uh, my class, and at that time, the state gave a scholarship to the outstanding student in each school over 500 population. So I had two scholarships, so it didn't cost me too much. And I lettered in college in football and basketball and track. I had a total of 10 letters. So I got along pretty well. Yeah. Um, I understand you got a letter from Theodore Roosevelt. Can you tell us a little about that? Well, I had, uh, sounds like bragging maybe, but it isn't. I had a, <clears throat> quite a school record, and my average for the four years was 92.5, I believe. <clears throat> and uh, someone sent in my record. I was on the debate team, and. Uh, oration and so forth and all the sports and I didn't know anything about it until I got this letter from Roosevelt congratulating me on my record. So I have it framed and hanging on the wall. Um, were you named after Th Theodore Roos Roosevelt? Yes, and the queer part of it is my dad was a Stones Democrat but he thought Roosevelt was a wonderful guy so he named him after him. Pretty big name to carry around, you know. Um, 
I understand you were in World War One. How long were you in there, and where were you? <clears throat> well, uh, I was a junior in high school. A uh, uh, reserve officer in the United States Army came to our town and organized a National Guard unit, and he got it in people from other neighboring towns. We had a full unit. We were given uniforms, we drilled, got paid for it. And then uh, the World War came along and they drafted us in federal service and sent us down to Mexico to Chancho, Pancho Villa back across the river. And Pancho would come across and steal the horses and cattle and burn the houses of people in southern Mexico. And uh, we stayed down there. I think seven months, and then came back and finished up high school. Teachers were very good to us, let us make up all the work, and graduated, and then went to Washburn College, and started in taking law, and all of them who graduated in law the year before didn't have a job, so I talked to the counselor, and he said, why don't you switch to education? So I switched to education, and uh, majored in athletics, coaching, and so forth. That's about it. <laughs> um, where did you teach when you became a teacher? <laughs> I became a teacher when I was a senior in high school. The history teacher uh, left Christmas, got married, and said she wouldn't be back. And you don't find a teacher running around hunting jobs at Christmas. So the superintendent called me in and said, do you like history, don't you? And I said, yes, I do. And he said, well, you're going to teach uh, seniors in history. There were 26 of them, and they were real nice kids. And of course, I knew them real well. I was captain of the football team, so I made them behave. He'd helped me a lot, but I taught them and liked it. So I decided then to uh, be a coach. Uh, I had my master's degree in, I guess, over to CSU. I think we had that. Okay. <clears throat> and then I, uh, I went to school over in France, and uh, so when I had enough credits to graduate in the middle of the year, in my senior year, with the credits from the school I attended in France, and I talked to the register, and they said, well, we've cut off a lot of uh, required courses such as uh, hygiene and thesis writing and use of the library and so forth. And he said, you've got enough credits, you can graduate in the middle of the year. Well, in the meantime, the uh, superintendent of school near there came to me and he said, we want you to come be our coach. And I said, well, what's the deal? And he said, well, they caught the coach shooting dice for the some of the high school players, and we fired him, and we don't have any coat. And uh, I was planning on staying in school and getting my master's degree, but they, they gave me such a good salary. <laughs> and salaries then were about $1,200 a year, and they paid me $1,500. And uh, so I went out and coached. And the coach who was fired was still there, and we got to be real good friends. And he told me all about the players and everything. And he had taught them the fundamentals, but he hadn't given them any plays. All they did was run down the floor and shoot and run back down the floor and get ready and run up the floor and shoot and so forth. And so I gave him some plays. And uh, we played for the state championship. But uh, had some <clears throat> real good players. They were quick and fast. And, and, they hadn't seen this fast game they played then. I, we had a coach at, at Washburn that was fresh out of training school for athletics. And uh, so these other coaches didn't know what to do. We'd form them what they called his own defense in those days. Uh, most of them still have little gyms. And you'd line up and uh, put your hands out and you'd almost touch across that entire floor. And they'd dribble up there and then didn't know what to do. So, in the meantime, we'd grab the ball and run with it or something. It was a very good team. And then I, we got in, we, I came, my wife came out to Estes Park and fried ham, I would fried liver for breakfast and she hated the liver. So she 
told me to come out and see if I couldn't get a job. So I came out, but I didn't have a job, but I stayed a week or so. And, uh, and I uh, got the chance to come here. And so I came out here in the fall of the 1925. Our place in Fort Collins was about 10,000. They had one high school, which was a Lincoln Junior High, and now it's Lincoln Center, and no gymnasium. So we played all the basketball outdoors. It turned out to be a cold, wet, snowy fall, and uh, we couldn't go outdoors, so uh, we had study sessions, <laughs> which was more or less was getting doctors and uh, chiropractors and uh, anybody that would come up and talk to the gym classes. Some of them were, some of them were real good, and others, and, well, they filled what we needed. And then we had a Navy recruiter in town that would come up and lecture and, and show them how to take care of first aid and all that stuff. And we, we got along. <clears throat> um, didn't you also teach at Fort Collins High? So? Yeah. I went to uh, Fort Collins High in 1925, started teaching there. And my job was to go around to the six grade schools they had and set up a phys ed program. They didn't have any phys ed program, whatever. And just went to class and had recess at 10 o'clock till 10.15, and back to studies, and an hour off for dinner, and back to study. And school got out at 4 o'clock. But uh, I, I would go around these grade schools. The principals, God bless them, were all about 65 age 65, I would give a demonstration. And they were supposed to carry that out till I got back next week or 10 days. <laughs> you can see women, women 65 doing an exercise. Consequently, they didn't do it. So I came back and I said, kids, how'd you get along? Why, well, real well. She gave us a whistle and ball and told us to go outdoors and play. <laughs> So we changed that, and they put in full fifth ed, fifth ed course at Fort Collins High School. Made every boy take it unless he had a doctor's permit. I had classes with as many as 80 kids in class. I didn't even get to know them all. But uh, I gave them a lot of military drill and stuff, and we got along. And then they got the gymnasium in Melton, which was still too small for the crowd. It only seemed about 500 people and they'd stand out in the halls and look in the windows and try to see the games. We had a real good team. I enjoyed it very much. Um, I understand you had a paddle and all <laughs> Yeah, I, I think it's around someplace. I mean, some kid didn't, didn't behave while he was given a choice. I was taking a swap with a paddle. It was about that long and had holes in it. And it worked pretty well or staying after school for a week. And I didn't like staying after school, and they didn't either. And I didn't have to make them stay after school. I made them come to school half an hour early because I had football coaching after school. And they could write their name on the paddle. And <laughs> uh, for instance, some kid come in, pick up a girl's book and throw it out the window. What would you do with it? I paddled them. <laughs> and never had anybody object. Parents said, oh, go ahead. There's uh, this one kid, and his name was Stone. His dad was uh, uh, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court in Colorado. And he was on it. And they passed him around to about three of the teachers, and they'd kick him out of class. And so I said, I'll take him if you let me. He used to paddle, and he says, take him and do whatever you can. Nobody else wants him. <laughs> his name was Freddie Stone. and. Uh, so Freddie came in and stepped on some girl's foot. I think it jumped on it or something. I said, Fred, I'll see you after school. Okay. So I gave him a pretty good swat. And um, I think it was the next night, we had back to school night where the parents come in and here came Mr. Stone. And I thought, oh, oh, I'm in for it. And he came in and said, Blevins, I want to shake your hand. You're the only one to understand my boy and he understands you. And you have my permission to patent him any time he needs it, but make it a good one. <laughs> so we got along with him. I never had any trouble about paddling. People 
can't do it now, you can't touch them. But uh, then we have it. And the girls didn't like it because I wouldn't paddle them. I'd let them write their name on the paddle to <laughs> we get along them. <clears throat> when was Blevins named? Oh, I got the dedication. Did you, did you get it? When was it? It's been 12 or 13 years. I don't know. It's quite an honor. Well, it was nice to do it while you can still read it. So generally, they wait till after you're dead and gone and then name the school after you. But the, the teachers name them now. I don't know how they used to name them. Get after some noted person, I guess. But now the teachers name them. I was on the head of the committee. We didn't make it public. Do not get one named Shepherdson. She was a real fine teacher, especially with the kids that were having trouble. And she never got excited or anything. She was always at school early and you know, stayed late and took care of the kids that were having trouble. So we didn't have much trouble in getting one named after her. <clears throat> um, I understand there were trolleys back then. What were they like? <laughs> Well, there were streetcars. They're about as long. They weren't as long as this room. And you got on the front. I think there's only one door. Well, I guess there were two. No, they, they made it go out, come in and go out the front door so the motorman could collect the feet. And uh, they, they were four of them in town. One of them went, uh, came down College Avenue and one door out went down in Remington, one of them went out to City Park and turned around and came back. They're trying to put that in again now, but it would spoil the looks of it, I think. And then one of them went north, and they all met at, at College and Mountain. And so one of them would go out, and then the next one would go out, and the next one would go out. <laughs> but they got the kids there. They were kind of me sometimes. They pulled down the trolley, and and jump up and down on the back end of the uh, bus and the bus would jump the tracks, but then the motorman would generally just took it in stride and we got along. I think they started to nickel in, seems to me like. It wasn't very much. Um, this is a lovely house. I understand you collect antiques. Can you tell us a little bit well, about that? My wife is an antique collector. We moved out here in 1925, and we had a cedar chest, and she wouldn't leave uh, Kansas without bringing her sewing machine on. So we came out, and uh, there was a second-hand store downtown, and had a lot of stuff in there. I don't think the woman knew what all was in there. We went down there and scrounged around and found furniture that needed fixing and so forth. And I took a course and finished woodwork. And my wife got a, well, I got the teacher that tried to get him to cane some chair, and he said, I don't know anything about it, but I'd like to learn. He said, tell your wife if she can find a book on caning wood, caning chair and learn. And that's where it started. So she, I learned to finish it. And for instance, this chair, I think, we paid 50 cents for. It had just a canvas top in it, and we fixed it up with a pretty good chair. And as we travel back and forth to see our children, we get off the main road and find antique shops, and we had a lot of, she would collect everything. We said that was our cigarette money. And that's where we got started, we just kept going. This was, a, this table was about this much higher. And we went in and cut the legs off and put braces on, we finished it, had three coats of paint. One of them was black and the other one was green. I forget what color the other one was. Quite a job to take it off, but we did it. Well, thank you. This is Don Baker, and we're glad we got to interview you. Thank you.